everybody. My name is Alexis Wong and I am your MC for the Melting Pot book launch tonight. Um, <laughs> Sam and I have been best friends since middle school and I've had a front row seat to most, if not all, of her culinary adventures. Wow. It has been a wild ride. Um, her heart has always been in food and it is how she relates to people. It is how she shows love and affection for the people in her life. Um, but it's also how she takes in and understands the world. So I'm honored to be co-hosting tonight um, for her launch. And I know that this is a project that has been in the works for quite some time. Um, since Sam started this creative endeavor, I have watched her grow professionally and as a Chinese American woman who has more and more fully owned her unique story um, so I'm so excited for all of you to hear more about those stories and to fall in love with my best friend and her food. Um, so tonight, I'll just give you, you know, a general spiel, um, an outline for the event. We'll be doing a couple of exciting things. Uh, first, Sam is going to do a live sangria demonstration. So for those of you who want to follow along, you can go and grab your materials now. She'll be using ginger ale, white wine citrus, uh, fruits, and berries as her fruit addition. And she'll be adding a few cool garnishes, but again, if you're interested to follow along, you can go grab stuff now. If you already have your drink of choice prepared, perfect. Um, I'm going to pass off to Denise, who is going to explain tonight's drinking game. Denise, do you wanna lead us through what we'll be doing in terms of our drinking game? Hi everyone, I'm Denise. I'm one of Sam's good friends as well. Um, I've known her since high school. And a little bit about our friendship in food. Uh, let me tell you, I was once a very, very picky eater and Samantha really pushed me to try new foods and cuisine. And um, she exposed me to so many different types of food. And aside from that, she really allowed me to embrace her Chinese culture. We both are um, children of immigrants and so just that tradition that she allowed me to mm. have with her family. So aside from that, um, to make things fun, we are going to do a game and the game is buzzwords. So when you hear these five words during Samantha's Q&A and her chat about her book, um, take a sip, take a drink, uh, whatever drink you want, mocktails, cocktails, uh, tea, water, whatever your heart desires. Um, but I will also be including the buzzwords in the chat, just in case people are kind of flooding in late and in case you forget, because there are five. Um, so the five words that we are going to be listening for are stories, food, Asian American, inspiration, and recipes. So whenever you hear those five words, take a chug. And I'm gonna pass it on to Alexis. Hey guys. Oh, are we swapped? Ah, there I am. Okay. Um, awesome. Thanks, Denise. Everyone remember, drink and listen responsibly. Um, after Sam makes her sangria, we're going to dive into the book. She's going to tell us about her stories and share with us what she is excited to share with us about tonight. Um, and then I'll be back later to moderate a Q&A with Sam. So while she's doing her spiel about melting pot, if you want and if you have any questions, please slide into the chats and I'll be pooling all the questions to ask later at the end of the night. Um, at the very end of the night, Sam is going to do two giveaways. The first one is a signed copy of her book along with the mortar and pestle. Um, and the other one is a sponsored gift package from Mike's Mighty Ramen, who is one of our flagship sponsors for tonight's event. Um, you can't claim your prize unless you are still present on Zoom. So make sure you stick around. All right, I am going to pass it off to Sam for her sangria demonstration. Hello everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. You could be anywhere in, in the world, but you chose to be here with me on a Friday night. So I'm gonna try to make this as fun as I can. So we are going to be doing, we are gonna be doing a sangria demo. The recipe is also in the book. I also sent out like a post for um, those who wanna follow along and do the recipes. 
But I do have to tell you that I'm not going to quite exactly follow my recipe to a T. And there's a reason for that because I really want it, just like any other of the recipes that are in the book, there are so many room to kind of make it your own. And tonight I'm going to show you a little bit of how I'm thinking when I'm cooking and just show you kind of that inspiration behind it all. So first of all, we're going to make sangria. And first, for, first thing first, you got to think about the alcohol, okay? You got to think about the alcohol, the spirits, all those items that are involved when it comes to making sangria. So you can either, traditionally with sangria, you want to make it with a red wine. You can also make it with a white wine. Um, when you're thinking about today, I have a white wine, so I'm using a Spanish wine. Uh, when you're thinking about wine and what kind of wine you want to use, you want to think of it like you don't want to use your best wine. You don't want to use any expensive wine because at the end of the day, you're spiking it kind of with some like fruits, fruit bits. And so it's, it's not going to really, it, it's, you don't want to use your expensive wine. Uh, and then on top of that, you want to use a cheap wine, not one that will give you a hangover, but one that like, you know, a bottle that you're never going to use. I want to also add that when it comes to making sangria, these are probably items you already have in your house. So you do not want to go run, a, like run to the store for anything. I guarantee you, you can make these things at your house. So first of all, I am using a Spanish wine. Um, another white wine you can use is like a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, probably a Pinot Grigio, anything that has that crisp flavor. So when you're thinking about crisp flavor, you want to think of the best way I can explain it because I'm not a tea, you know a wine sommelier, and I often get confused by what they say. So a crisp flavor wine would be like if you're having a really a nice lemonade on a hot summer day, and the first sip you take, and it's like ah, that's exactly what you're looking for when you're thinking about a crisp wine. So today I have a white um, Spanish wine very um very budget friendly i think it's like five or six dollars at tj's what what um and then i also have a um an orange liqueur so you want to use like triple sec um you might want to use um any type of orange um flavor liquor you can think of but again my recipe doesn't have this you can actually add that depending on what kind of mood you're in if you know what i mean so i got a white wine all these different things that's that's the wine portion of it the next um, portion you want is you want your fruits so you're thinking about all these different kinds of fruits um <laughs> sorry um when you're thinking about the fruits you want to think so in my recipe again with my post i did a very um i did one that you're going to chill overnight and you're going to put it so you're going to try to use things like hard fruits and citrus so over here i have some blood oranges lemon green apples, all these different things. These are great for if you're going to chill for four hours or overnight. However, if you have girlfriends like you, I have the ones I have, they are going to come like with no invitation and they're going to come and be like, you need to make a party drink within half an hour to an hour. If you have girlfriends like that, I have the drink for you and that's what we're going to make today. So today I'm going to start off with a few things. Um, got my wine um, and I got my fruits. So I have some hard fruits, so I'm just going to go ahead. I think I said a cup in my recipe. Again, make it your own. This is a huge jar, a huge bag. I want to go ahead and just put some fruit in here. I also really want to add berries because berries are able to infuse into the alcohol really fast, and you really get that fresh and crisp flavor we're looking for when it comes to sangria. So I'm going to go ahead and just dump it. And now that we have all these um, fruits on the bottom, I'm going to go ahead and just leave it here. I'm gonna dump some turbinado sugar, some cane sugar. Basically, I went to Starbucks and you know got the sugar packets, and you know how that goes. So I went ahead, I'm gonna to toss that in. And one thing you really want to do if you were gonna add spirits, I would now um, add some of the liqueur in now. So you know, let's let's just be a little conservative, you know, maybe one or two. Um, there you go. You're going to put it in here. And what I want to do is I kind of want to mix the fruit, you know, because I kind of want the, I want the sugar to kind of gel with the, the, the spirits and kind of let it marinate. In a perfect world, I would love to let it sit for 15 to 20 minutes, um, for 15 to 20 minutes. But if not, I would love to, um, you know, just go ahead and get right to it. So right now I'm going to add this whole bottle of wine. 
So let's just go. In fact, I've got this wine. I also have some orange juice and I have some ginger ale. Ooh, sorry, you know. As you can see, this is super easy. Like, I'm not really overthinking it. And it really, when you're making sangria, do not overthink it, okay? Especially when it comes to like adding the fruit. I'm gonna add like one or two cups. I'm just gonna go ahead and add that in. I mean, we do have a little bit of sugar. You wanna just, um, I'm gonna maybe like, you know, take a sip or a taste later and just see how I wanna make it. But you can see, again, this is kind of what we're working with. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pour this ginger out. So you can do any type of um, fizzy. You can think of like something light, like maybe a Sprite, um, any lemon citrus um, fizzy, you wanna add that into it. And now you can already see it's such a pretty um, color. And I'm gonna I have this uh, meddler. I'm just gonna go ahead and just kind of release the citrus juice because I need flavors fast. My girlfriends are coming ASAP and I need to make sure that they got a drink. So I have to quickly, you know, meddle it in, whatever you want to call it. And there we go. And that is kind of our sangria. But let's not stop there because I'm about to pour myself a little cup. So I already have my little thing of ice in here. And I'm going to go ahead. You know, again, if you can marinate this for 30 minutes, that'll be great. But, you know, for live purposes, we're just going to go ahead and just go ahead and spoon through it. And you can already see it's all look really pretty colors. You know, it has a very vibrant um, look to it. You can already see, look at all these different colorful flavors. And last but not least, if you really want to take it in like up a notch when it comes to having a girls night out you really want to think about presentation so i have a few ideas for you when you come when it comes to garnishing so one you can take out this really beautiful blood orange you can just go ahead and cut it slightly halfway in the middle and you can just stick it onto your drink that's a really great way of doing it i also did the same thing with the strawberry i need to find a little incision but you know what go ahead and just put both on it and like you can see Another way is you're gonna cut it in half again. So if you see this halfway, you can leave it like that and you can kind of have like a very cute little, um, little cross, little like jam. It's not working, but it's okay. But you can see this is like a really beautiful sangria and it is very simple, easy. I do again wanna stress that when you're making sangria, please think about what you have in your house before you go out to the store because i guarantee you you have most of these things anyways so anyways i got my drink i hope you all have your drink too and i'm gonna pass it back to alexis hello okay so now we're just gonna get settled if you need a second to run and go and get your drinks and get prepared and settled in for sam's uh talk about her book melting pot Go ahead, do okay, that. I'm now. muted. I'm talking. Sorry. Oh, um, I'm talking, killing time for all of you guys. <laughs> so, Sam, when you're ready and you think everyone else should be ready, it's all you. Yay. Okay. Hold on. I just need to get my outline out here. So, anyways, I just want to read some of these stories. Ooh. Okay. Awesome. So first of all, I really want to um, talk a little bit about Melting Pot and kind of like, you know, the overview of the book and what kind of highlights to expect. So um, I know a lot of you actually didn't know that I was working on Melting Pot. It was in the work for like two years. Um, and like, it, it's crazy to me to see that it's actually all coming together. But I really wanted to go ahead and talk about the themes that you might want to look for when you're reading Melting Pot, just to like, like, you know, it'll just be fun to like see that whatever I'm talking about tonight when you're reading it, it'll just, it'll just all make sense if that makes sense. So first of all, um, the overview of the book is that um, Melting Pot is comprised of 11 short stories and 66 recipes. Within each story, there is six recipes that follow um, the stories. So traditionally, like a cookbook, they usually have the stories follow the recipes, whereas this cookbook is more about the stories and the recipes are following the stories. So think of that when you're reading the book. Um, some of the themes to look out for, um, 
one, obviously it's about food. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a cookbook. So it, it has to do with food, but I realized at a very young age that food brings people together. It has the power to trigger, um, you know, nostalgic memories. It has the power to bring people um, together on the table and it has power to create new memories. And so I always said, there are two types of people in this world. There are people who plan their activities around food and there are people who plan their food around activities. Well, you can guess what kind of person I was. I, as the food was at the center of every celebration, being Cantonese too, of Cantonese, I ate all the time. And so why it's really funny because I start with the first chapter called One Pot Wonder. And One Pot Wonder is basically de a chapter dedicated to my mother. So One Pot Wonder is about basically my mom, who is the outlier of the family, who doesn't even like to eat that much. She was very bland in her cooking. And I know you guys may think I'm a little harsh, but no, seriously, like, like that's just how my mom is and we joke about it all the time. But my mom would throw all these random ingredients into a pot every night. And she would just turn it on and wait till the food looked edible. So I call it One Pot Wonder because one, you never knew what you're going to get at the table. And two, it ne you never get the same food twice. And I talk about this tension that existed within myself as a child who really loved food and being like, oh my goodness, like how come I'm eating such bland food day after day? So um, it's kind of funny because, you know, obviously I'm talking about food, but then I talk about my mother, which is like the irony of the whole story. And in that specific chapter, One Pot Wonder has all these unique recipes that are basically like, you just need like either a wok for everything or a pot or a pressure cooker, whatever it is, it's one pot. So then another thing to really look out for is this idea of this childlike imagination and curiosity. See, um, when I was younger, I had the craziest imagination. I mean, there's a story in my book called Cookie Clock, which basically, it started off with, when I was younger, I was just kind of not the kid that, you know, was following directions really well. Um, I, you know, I, I talked back to the teachers. I just, I just wasn't so, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't the kid who was getting the apple, if that makes sense. And so basically, I, also, because I was living in so many different environments, I also felt like a misfit my entire life. So um, I also experienced a fair share of bullying in elementary school. So I was like, you know what? I found the greatest thing ever, and that was called fake and sick. So a lot of times I would stay home and pretend to be sick. So while everybody went to work and everybody went to school, I would go into the kitchen and make all these fun creations. But on top of that, I would watch TV a lot. And I would watch everything from the fraternity TV shows all the way to, you know, um, you know, cooking shows with like Martha Stewart, Nigella Lawson, all these different people. And that like that little window of, you know, um, that little window of the television that presented to me was just so exciting to me that I was so like, it opened up a new world of like a chicken could be cut and it could be cooked in 10 different ways. I was, I was ecstatic, you know? And, you know, after I would watch these cooking shows, I would go back into my um, kitchen, my little apartment kitchen, and I would start cooking everything. Problem is, is that I was limited on tools. Like you go to like my mom's kitchen back then, every, the few things were a guarantee, a cleaver, a rice cooker and like, you know, chopsticks, all those different things. So I had to really use my imagination. So when I was in the kitchen, I would pretend I was the star of my own show. And I would be like, la di da di da like just talking and talking and talking. And I, at one point, I got the courage to start baking. But because my, the women in my life, they never measured anything. I thought I could get away with it too. So here I was making cookies and it was disastrous and I ended up clogging my sink. And that chapter is called Cookie Clock. And I didn't realize, but later I found out that, you know, baking is a science, whereas cooking is an art. And I didn't know that then. And so that's why there's one chapter that's called Cookie Clock. And all the recipes there are for people who are afraid to be baking anything. And it has like a thing like, we have like a stovetop crisp on it, which has like a very crispy, 
um, topping when you're using granola, that's kind of like your cobbler stat, it's kind of like a play on a cobbler or a, you know, um, a, a traditional crisp. We have like a candy bacon um, stove top s'more. So there's just a lot of little play on childlike food. Another theme I really want to talk about is um, the impactful woman in my life. So if you read the stories, there are definitely story chapters that are dedicated to a lot of the women that really made a huge impact in my life. Specifically, one chapter that I am in love with, it's called To My Surrogate Mothers. And this is really ironic because tonight, Alexis, who is our MC, it's about her mother, Gwen. Now, Gwen was such a, like a complex and exciting lady. She was a businesswoman. She was, um, you know, she was a businesswoman. She made dinner on the table and she was always just so full of light. And I remember because I threw spitballs at Alexis and instead Alexis invited me to her birthday party. I don't know why she did that, but I remember the first time I walked into her home, it was like this house smelling like cinnamon sticks and, and cider. And I just felt instantly warm and I, I wanted to be part of that family. Um, and one of the ways that, you know, Gwen really opened up her, um, her life to me was by allowing me to be in her kitchen all the time. So when I opened her kitchen, there was all these different spices and, and all these different foods and, you know, like saffron from the Middle East, you know, cumin, vanilla beans and pods. These were access that I never had my entire life. And she was so open about me just messing with every little thing. And not only that, um, she took us to many different restaurants. Like she would drive us in her big black Cadillac. We would listen to R&B music and rap music and we would just go ham, listen to music. And at the end of the night, there was always a moral of doing good or really coming to um, terms of like, you know, any, we, we talked a lot about our identity. And it's very interesting because, you know, Alexa's mom, Gwen was Creole, so her background and then she also, her Alexa's dad is Chinese. So immediately I was exposed to this different world um, that I had not, uh, would have never been exposed to had it not been Gwen, Gwen and Alexa's family. And in that specific chapter, you'll find all these really exotic um, recipes. Like, you know, we have, I think an Indian butter chicken. I'm sorry, I, I'm really bad with the memory of the title of the names. I don't, but uh, we got that, we got Mediterranean chicken. We have crown sugar dip. Like we just had so many uh, wide ranges of cuisines. And that was largely partially because of Alexa's mother's influence in my life. Um, another thing to really look out for is this idea of identity. Um, you know, I, like I said, I didn't do really well in school. So when I went to, um, I think after, yeah, in high school, I just wanted to have a great social life, which I felt like I did achieve, but I never applied to college. And therefore, when I was, you know, just hanging out in my house all the time, going out every night, I realized like I had to have something else going on. So a friend of mine told me, hey, you love to cook all the time. Why don't you go to culinary school? So it was just like, oh yeah, I didn't think too much about it. But it was, ama it was a, an amazing experience because for once I was in an environment where I met so many different people, like the people, the, my, the, my culinary peers were also misfits. They were all dynamic. Some were cussing like a sailor. Some were really delicate and made really beautiful pastries. Like there was just such a huge group of us. And not only that, I learned for the first time in my life that in life you need to have structure which I wasn't really quite used to, you know, for a long time, I was very against authority. And, you know, I didn't want people to tell me what to do. And it was through that, I learned it through food. So um, for example, when we would learn a new recipe, I would learn it to a T, but only to go home to break all those recipes and fuse it with my own flavors and, and try to make new plates or dishes out of it. And in that specific, um, in that specific, um, chapter you'll find a lot of the culinary foods like i you know i did like roasted chicken is one of them but then i made it in a harissa roasted chicken a spatch cut where you take the backbone out so it bakes evenly and it's a lot juicier um you can see there's a granddaddy of 
all the culinary sauces, which one is called bechamel, um, which is used for, you know, you can make um, fondue, um, you know, um, cheese sauces, macaroni and cheese, all those different funky things. So that was um, in um, kind of later three fourths of the book. Um, the other um, last theme you're gonna really recognize is um, I talk a lot about my Asian American background and how it's really shaped me to being who I am. Because for a long time, I was very ashamed of being Asian American. Um, I felt like I, I was, um, you know, I, I was made fun for it. You know, like I had, you know, I, I felt like, you know, kids would make fun of me or I felt, you know, I just, I just couldn't understand the culture, you know, Eastern culture is just so different from, you know, Western culture. And, you know, I just, I just wasn't comfortable in my own skin, if that makes sense. Um, and so I had an opportunity in 2015 to go to China and I lived there for a whole entire year. And I fell in love with street food and the, and it was through the food that I found this like new appreciation for the resourcefulness of the people that I came, like the long line of people I came from and just like all these crazy ingredients, like everything kind of just made sense after that. And I really want to read you all a quick excerpt from my last, um, from my last chapter in my book. And this chapter is called Motherland. So um, let me read this. Throughout my entire life, I had never felt fully Chinese or fully American. A gap stood between these two parts that I couldn't bridge. I didn't understand my family's history and upbringing within the context of my own largely Western experience. I lived disjointed and not knowing exactly what was in its place. Not being able to reconcile these parallel parts of my life, I felt out of sync and I resented it. However, the immersion into an Eastern mindset made me understand that our life experience is based largely on our interpretation of it. The concept that one way of life was either right or wrong, better or worse than another did not exist. I didn't need to be more Chinese or more American. There was no conflict. I see the world uniquely because of being Chinese American. In China, a culture where seemingly anything goes, my ideal of what I should be evaporated along with the persona that had accompanied them. I traded in my demands for the life I thought I was supposed to have been born into. And instead, I'm embracing the integration of two in one. Across oceans, I came home. So that is actually the last chapter of my book. And in Motherland, you'll find all these really cool recipes. They're not even like traditional Shanghainese or Chinese, um, you know, Chinese recipes. It's the recipes that I made while I was out there. And kind of like it, it gives a little background. Each, each, um, each one will give you a little background of like why I chose to put that um, recipe in the book. But yes, that is kind of like the themes that you should be expecting to when you're reading it. I hope that uh, not, uh, you know, I not only feed your, you know, stomach, but I feed your soul in any shape or form. So I am actually done here and I will let um, Alexis take it back. Hey guys. Okay, Sam, thank you so much. I, I think I needed to hear you read that. I think it touched me in a different way than reading it myself. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're going to do the Q&A now. Um, I was trying to keep up with the chats, but you guys are active. Love it. Um, <laughs> I'll keep an eye on the chats right now, but if you guys have any questions for Sam, send them in there. I'll keep an eye. Um, mm -hmm. But I have a couple of questions that some of you asked via Instagram and then a couple of my own. So Sam, you ready? Yes, so I am. Oh my one God. of the questions... Sorry, go ahead. No, I just like, you know, I just exit out of a browser with all these tabs in it, but it's okay. Keep going. <laughs> Such is the life. Um, okay. Oh, there's one here. Mm -hmm. This is a good starting point. Jimmy and Rachel would like to know what's your favorite recipe in the book or what is a recipe that is a good starting point for beginners? Ooh. Gosh, there's so many. Which, wh which one do you think I should start off with? The first or the second? I think you should start off with, what's your favorite recipe? Hmm. Okay, my favorite <laughs> recipe. That's so hard. Honestly, I can't tell you 
I, if I have a favorite recipe or not. But obviously, if you guys saw on the cover um, over here, this is my this is the cover we chose, um, and this is the chicken noodle. Um, this is the chick flavor ramen. Um, I don't know if this is my favorite one, but this best describes kind of like how I cook because this specific chapter is about my grandmother, which I call title Scrappy. So my grandmother, she was sustainable, like before it was even popular. And she would mix, she was from the southern tip of China, which is called Guangzhou. And over there, they get fresh ingredients all the time. But when my grandmother came to America, she fell in love with the convenience of American food. So she would buy spam. She bought a lot of canned corn and thought it was healthy. And I mean, maybe it, maybe in some ways it can be, but she loved to integrate, um, you know, convenience food with, um, you know, um, fresh foods and fresh ingredients. And so I think that is kind of like encapsulates kind of how I cook as well. So I think that would be it. Awesome. I, I will say having been in the kitchen with you, um, in like an apropos moment or in a impromptu moment, <laughs> you also are very scrappy. So I have a feeling that your the answer to this question, what's your favorite recipe in the book? I think you have a favorite maybe meal or maybe like general like group of meals. Um, but every time you cook, I feel like it's different. Like I feel like I, as your friend, cannot keep up with you in the kitchen. <laughs> Like, you told me it was this way. That's how you made it last time. <laughs> and that is why um, when we're doing this cookbook, it's funny. Um, I was going to give a shout out to the team that I was working with when we came to make the melting pot. But I did have a recipe editor because I was nervous about, like, you know, the way that I cook in the kitchen. Similar to my family, um, we, don't, we don't use measuring cups. So I really, that was a really huge battle for me. And I'm really happy um, Kelsey, um, who is a recipe editor, was able to help me with that. That's awesome. Um, so there is um, another question that is similar to that, but maybe this will give you a better idea of how to answer. What was your most inspired recipe? And I didn't, I got this question off of your Instagram poll. So mm -hmm. I think what they're asking is maybe what is, something that you cook that in your book makes you feel some type of emotion because i know that you are an emotional culinary okay. genius so pick an emotion give us a recipe and we would love to hear about that okay give me one second because i really <laughs> want to give you a thoughtful answer you know i can really want to give you a thoughtful answer mm. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, damn, that's hard. Uh, oh, cranberry meatloaf. Cranberry meatloaf. Uh, if you guys ever get the opportunity to try any of the recipes in the book, I guarantee you I've made cranberry meatloaf so many times. So I used to work at uh, San Jose Mercury News and I used to do their global menus. And one of the things is um, I feel this, I think kind of this was kind of a turning point for me because for a long time, I would always try to order foods to make a specific thing. And there was one time we had a lot of hamburger meat and we didn't know what to do with it. We had logs and logs of it. And I was like, you know, we should make meatloaf. And it was the way that I just remember like, you know, making it, it was so different from a traditional meatloaf recipe and the response that I got out of it because afterwards, I made this meatloaf at San Jose Mercury News, all the employees asked to take it home. So this became a take home program. And that was the first time I was like, wow, like, damn, like, you know, I don't need all these different things. Like I can craft anything out of anything. And in fact, I have more creativity when I'm limited. And so I think that sparks a little bit of joy and emotion at the same time for me. That's awesome. Um, okay, let's see. We got some couple in the chats. So Amy is asking, what is um, a must-have kitchen tool that most people might not know about? Ooh, okay. Like I said earlier, when I was growing up, 
I hated to use the cleaver. It was so intimidating. Like a cleaver is kind of like, it looks like a rectangle knife. And you use it, like a lot of people use it in like Chinese restaurants because it is one knife for all things. Like you want to cut bread, you want to cut meat, you want to hack into bones, like that's your thing. And if you want to like smack a garlic, a whole head of garlic, you just go ahead and smack it. <laughs> So you can use, and then it's also like a spatula. So when you're cooking, when you're chopping, you can also scrape it and you can use it as a spatula to use all these different things. So for me, I think it's the cleaver. Um, I do yeah. feel like that is the quintessential Asian home like tool. Oh yeah. Every Asian home has one. Mm -hmm. um, very underrated in other homes. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's see. Jared asked, what specific moment made you realize you wanted to write this book? Wow, that's yeah. deep. It's a big one. Deep, homie. Oh. Okay, so um, I think what made me wanted to write this book was actually a childhood memory. I think a lot of the reason why I wrote this book has to do with my childhood memories. Uh, when I was younger, I was considered the latchkey kid among all my friends group. I was always by myself. I was always doing my own thing. And I would used to hang out at the library or bookstores for hours on day. I would read two things and two things only. One, I would skim through picture books that have food on it. And two, I would love to read um, Chicken Noodle for Soul. And when I read Chicken Noodle for Soul, it like really touched my heart because here I was, you know, like trying to figure out who I was. And I would read these stories about people who had overcome so much adversity or a huge amount of loss. And they were able to overcome so much and it was through and and I remember like when I was thinking about writing this book I was like what if I combine my two favorite things together photos of food and recipes and then add like stories because ultimately I really wanted to connect with people. I wanted to use Medicine Pause as a vehicle to connect with people because I never, as a, as a young girl, I never read like these type of stories from first person, from an Asian American woman um, reading about someone in the first person. And I wanted someone to maybe even whether they're younger or later to have perspective. Like when, if I had read this earlier and in, in when I was younger, and read about like something about a body image issue of like, damn, like, I can't believe she had, she went through that and she's okay. And she's on the other side now. I kind of wanted to do the same thing. Or if it was somebody who has already made it through that side, it's like, yeah, I get it. Like, I just really wanted to find this sis, un, like kind of invisible sisterhood or invisible like connection with all these different people. That's awesome. Yeah, my, um, I have another question on the list that is why a book and why not another medium? but it sounds like you're pretty clear that you wanted this to be something that lasts, something that people can pick up later, people can read now, um, and in that way is, is accessible to so many more people. Um, Just took the word out of my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see, what was the next question? Uh, you guys are awesome about putting questions in here, but it's scrolling up. Okay, let's see. Um, Francis. <laughs> Francis asks, if you were to write another book, what would be the theme of that one? And why would that theme be important for you to share next? Ooh, big question. Honestly, I'll be very 100% honest. I think this is the only and probably the last cookbook ever. It was a lot of work, you know, um, but I also feel like I want to do, I, I want to like, I kind of in some ways after this book, I realized I had a hu way huger passion in storytelling. So I really want to explore more on that side. However, um, if food is the way for me to get into people's uh, minds and hearts, that's another way. I, that's, that's something I'm totally willing to explore. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, you definitely have a way of getting into people's hearts and stomachs. So, <laughs> um, okay, so Alexis asked, Alexis, yep, asked, what is your favorite kitchen hack? Oh, that's a good one. Oh, favorite kitchen hack. Damn, I got so many. Okay, this this is really telling about my personality. But <laughs> you guys know me, you guys, if you know, like if you really are my like tight homies, you know I do not like to spend an extra buck for nothing. So part of that is like, I love to scrape little things like, you know, like little ketchup packets, barbecue sauces and all these different things. When you're like cooking for one person, sometimes those things come in ha handy really quick. Um, for example, you know, um, I have like little like 
little containers of like chili oil or all these little things that are in my fridge that's like this little sack of all these random things and anytime i'm making eggs or any of those type of things i just throw it in and it really just adds this really great flavor um or like if i'm making noodles just throw it in um i just i just love keeping i love taking people's scraps like you know what i'm saying like if i'm at the garden i'll grab some scraps if you're at your house, if you have a party at your house and you're like, I'm about to throw all this stuff in the trash bin, I will be there to recept everything. And I think the ones who know me, know me. Uh, so <laughs> that is my hack, but I know that not everybody will follow my hacks. <laughs> um, that is hilarious and also uh, Very good. consistent with you. Um, <laughs> okay, so I wanna bring you back to the book a little bit question-wise. Um, I know that you have way more food stories than you put in this book. Um, so I want to know why did you put the stories that you put in this book? Why were these ones important? Um, and what does that say about what you want us to know about your experience in the kitchen and in life? Sorry, can you say that again? Sorry, I, I don't yeah. know. I know you I know you have a ton of recipes in this book um, and you group them so well so the groupings like the surrogate mom the one pot wonder um, why did you choose to tell those stories through these different recipes and what is it that you are trying to share about your experience and your journey with us what yeah. would you like us to get from that well, it's very interesting because, um, well, Francis, who's working IT today in this uh, Zoom, um, he, uh, two years ago, I had this opportunity to talk um, about my journey with food. And I realized that this was always, like, food was always this timeline. And um, for me, like, there was everything, every memory I've ever associated had to do with food. You know how some people, like, they like, oh, I know what we did because you wore this specific outfit. I would be like, I know exactly what we did because we ate that specific meal. Do you remember that? So it, I always associated everything with food. And so therefore, um, you know, it made, it made perfect sense for me to kind of lean into that, if that makes sense. Awesome. Did I your question? I feel like I lost my train of thought while I was talking to you. <laughs> well, I feel like you got, no, I feel like you got, I feel like you got around it. Um, I guess, yeah, like I, I know you have so many more, like there are things that when you were telling me about this book, I was like, oh, I hope she includes like this or that recipe. Um, and some of them you included, obviously. Um, but other ones I was like so surprised about, you know, like the recipe about the cinnamon, like the cinnamon sugar or brown sugar dip. Mm. Um, it's, it was like touching as somebody who, I mean, you were writing about my, my mom, <laughs> um, but it was like so sweet and so touching that even these like little side dishes, cause that is quite literally a side dish is a dip. It's not even like a, a full yeah. meal, but things like that were something that you paid attention to and something that you felt was like really important to put in here. And so what was your thought process when you were like, what? foods from my lifetime, liter quite literally, yeah. are important to put in this. Um, what like, food you, my lifetime? you know, I, I will, I will like something sparked while you were saying something about like why the brown sugar dip. Um, you know, one of the things I will say about your family is that I never really had a lot of traditions in my house. And in the chapter holiday traditions, it talks about me wanting traditions so bad. So when I, the time I met you, right, I was, your family's all about traditions. Christmas, Thanksgiving, every, you know, there's always something that you did, you know, there's always Christmas decorations, all these different things. So for me, it was like the perfect home to infuse myself in, you know, because it was just like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been wanting my entire life. And not only that, your mom was always like, you know, if you eat, I eat, you know, if you get something, I get something. So it was just like the perfect I felt like, um, you know, the brown sugar dip was really resemble of the Thanksgiving holiday when you used to make, because that was something you used to make. Like, you know, your mom would do the heavy lifting, but you make the, you know, you did the, you know, <laughs> your sauce and the brown sugar dip. So I always remember that. That's why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, okay. So this is another one from Instagram that I thought was really good. How has your palate evolved over the years oh goodness yeah so when i was younger 
I didn't, I, you know, I actually remember I taught, I told everybody that like I had this, you know, and I think it's very common for a lot of Asian American people to have this kind of self hatred towards themselves where they really wanted to do, you know, stay away from anything that was Asian culture. And so for a long time, I really just love American food. And I don't think it was intentional or anything, but I loved McDonald's. I love all the like, you know, the greasy foods and everything. And then as I got older and I got it, you know, the, your mom was one of those influences and in other people but I got exposed to all these different types of food and I got really into bold flavors. I got, um, and then, and then closer when I went to culinary school, I got really refined, you know, I was eating like that fine dining sh stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, later, but like now, you know, with my life, you know, I just really, I value convenience so much, you know, I cook when I'm with friends, but truthfully, I, I do a lot of like pre-packaged foods because it's just convenient for me and I'll mix it again with all these different items to make it kind of gourmet. But, you know, truthfully, that is kind of how I'm living and how I'm eating. Yeah. Listen, culinary professionals, they're just like us. <laughs> you know, you guys would be surprised. Usually the chefs eat the most basic stuff. They eat eggs all the time. They eat like very simple stuff. You know, they're just, so it, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Justin Lee asked in the chat, what is your favorite Cantonese dish to cook or eat or both? Oh, gosh, that is so hard to say. Uh, wow. That's, 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 that's deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to say, uh, I would say maybe like, let me think about my grandmother who's Cantonese. Um, I would say the rush, uh, not Russian, sorry. It is called the Hong Kong style borscht, which is like made with a lot of bones and beef meats. And it's like has tomatoes. It has like, and it has a sweet component and it's slightly spicy. Um, I think that is one of my favorite things to meet, meet um, make because, um, it, growing up, you know, my mom used to make huge pots of soup and just leave it on the stovetop even overnight. I don't know how sanitary that was, but you know, I'm here. I saw the bug and I'm still good. But that's one of those recipes I, I always remember. Like you just make a big pot of it and everybody drinks from it. And it's always kind of, it's decent, you know, and it's like, it's good. It's good. It's homey. It's hearty. You know, <laughs> what did you like die? No, girl, I'm still standing. <laughs> Um, that sounds awesome. I would like to have that next time I'm home. So, you know, putting in my order now. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so AJ says, who or asks, who is your favorite chef and how do they inspire you? Good one, AJ. Oh my gosh. That's a really good one, honey. Good one. Uh, so, uh, that one is, I would say Nigella Lawson. She's um, amazing. She's from the UK. I don't know if you guys know her, but she is a gorgeous, a curvy woman, and she beautiful. is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, gorgeous and curvy. And the reason why I say she, she was an inspiration to me is because of the way she cooked. So if you've seen cooking shows, a lot of it's really staged. Like even today, I stage this stuff. I wouldn't. I normally would not get these bowls out for you. In fact, I just dump it into one bowl. So like, you know. But Nigella was very similar in the sense that she would take like, let's just say a sack of flour from her cabinet and legit dump it into like whatever batter she was making. And I found that so refreshing because like most of us cook that way, you know, most of us don't have this, you know, dream kitchen with these like really nice appliances and whatnot. And I just saw the way she cooked and the way she talked. I mean, obviously when you have a UK accent, like, whew, you know what I mean? So I just thought she was so amazing and I, I loved, and she used to do these midnight snacks. Like they would film her in the They're my favorite. What? I don't remember those, they're my favorite. Sorry, continue. <laughs> she would like take a cake out and she's like, oh, that's gorgeous. Oh, that's yeah. gorgeous. <laughs> You know? And I just thought, oh my gosh, I just love her so much. And, and another part of it is, cause when I was younger, I also, you know, I always, and I think you know this, Alexis, I've always struggled with, you know, body image because when I was younger, I wasn't a stick Asian, you know, um, that was just not my body size. And I was trying to figure out why I had a butt and like all these different things. And it, it was just really confusing for me. And I, I almost felt like when I looked at her and was so confident, it just made me feel like, Ooh, like 
I could be that too. So that's one of the reasons why she's like all encompassing my role model. Yeah. I mean, she's yes, awesome. Nigella, yes, Nigella. Um, oh, this is a good one because I also would like to know what, do you have a favorite place where you get your kitchenware from? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, 2021 is when I start upgrading my kitchenware. Um, I don't really say I, I do have like a lot of places that I'm like, oh, I really wish I had it. But being, being me, like I just use whatever and I run it to the ground. So um, if you're interested, um, I would say Sterla Todd is a really good place, Rolly and Sonoma. Um, I do have like a few items from all of those different places, but I'm honestly a mix and match person. Awesome. All right. Sean, aka Trisha's boyfriend, asked, what is your favorite restaurant in the Bay Area? Oh, I think that's the hardest question of the night because I think I'm going to, you know, let me think about it. You know, okay, so I don't know if you all know this, but I was on the show called Check, Please. And I have this huge affinity for Turkish food. I love, 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 love Turkish food. And so there's this place in Palo Alto called Anatolian's Kitchen, and they just make really authentic um, Turkish food. Um, there's this thing called Alexander Favorite where they soak up cubes of butter bread, and they make the bread in-house, by the way, and they slaughter it with like a bunch of I think it's beef, right, Nini? Like, me and Nini go here all the time. Yeah, beef, and then tomato sauce, and a pool of yogurt sauce. And it is amazing. It's just, you know, I just love all the bold flavors. There's nothing like it out here. So I think if you're in the Paul area, Sean, take your girl Trisha there, okay? Um, we're talking about El Farolito, yeah. but <laughs> yours sounds great, too. <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, so yeah. there is another one that I thought was good. So this is from Tara Nash. She says, what are some cities or countries with notable food you love, you would love to visit again post pandemic? Oh, that's such a good question. You know, what? I won't lie to you guys, you know, like, I go to a lot of these places and I realize, you know, Bay Area has really great foods, you know, whether it, it you know, ethnic food, like any type of ethnic foods, it's, it's really great. So um, one place in particular that stood out in my mind is obviously Thailand. I just love Thailand because it has so many different flavor profiles. It hits every palate in my mouth, like, you know, sweet, it's salty, savory, um, it's sugary, it's tangy, it's everything you want. So I really feel like you know, and if you do, if you ever go to any of these places, go to, um, what's that place called? Go take a cooking class because it is, it, it will, it will blow your mind, you know. That's awesome. Yeah, I remember seeing your stories when you were there. I was like, ugh, everything you were making, everything you were eating. So good. Um, it is cheap. It is, yeah. Yes, they're cheap. <laughs> I love all these cheap people. Everybody, put on the chat, you're cheap. There you go. Um, okay, so I'm not sure. It looks like Justin Lee had a question about what episode of Check, Please you were on. Maybe you could also post this on um, some social so we can watch it if that's possible, but you might I don't even remember which episode I was on. This was like three years ago, so I have no, I have no stinking clue, but I will, I will get back to you, Justin Lee. Um, yeah, maybe post it on social so we can see it if it's okay. like, if it's possible. Okay. We'll do. Um, all right. I think I'm looking for some more questions. Um, I think that's it. So okay, I need to get we, my Yeah. So we, you definitely do not need to have had your book delivered to you already. I know it's taking a little bit of time to get things shipped. Um, but if in fact you do have your book, Sam has requested that we all take a photo with our book put up to the screen um keep it up for a little bit i know some of you probably don't have your screens on and that's totally fine if you're not about it um but for the rest of you who are totally down for a group pick via zoom um we're gonna do that now hold it up for like a little bit i'll tell you when we're done like scooping all the photos um because we have to go through a couple of slides since there's so many of you 
So is everybody ready? I think my I'm responsible for taking the photo and here we go. The melting pot. Oh my gosh, y'all are making <laughs> Hold on, hold on, keep them up, keep them up. Keep them up, keep them up. Yes. Awesome. Yay. Um, great. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. I, this is the end of my involvement in this night. Um, but we really appreciate you guys coming and celebrating the launch of this book baby that Sam has delivered to all of us. Um, she has worked so hard and we were all so excited to finally be able to see the fruit of her labor and her creative brain. Um, I really hope you enjoy the book. Sam is going to take it away and she is going to do the giveaway now. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Alexis, Denise, and Francis, who is in the background running the Zoom in the background. Um, I really want to take this time to thank you all because, again, like I said earlier, this is a Friday night. So I know it's really hard to be here, whether you guys have kids or whatever the situation is. I really, truly, truly, truly appreciate you all being here. And um, another thing I really want to extend this thank you to is the team that I work with. You know, I think a lot of people have asked me, how the hell did you publish this, um, you know, book? I really couldn't have done so without a few people on this team. And I really just want to take the time to highlight them. Um, first with Hannah, who was legit, like honestly, the guardian angel for me this year. Um, she designed the book. She photo she photographed my photos. Um, I mean, my food. And she basically helped manage the whole project. And that is a huge, that was a huge thing. And she is amazingly talented. Um, but Hannah, thank you so much. Um, Julianne, who is our developmental ed editor, um, I feel bad for Julianne because I sent her some really crappy um, rough drafts to work with and I had to like, she had to catch my thoughts because, you know, I'm very erratic sometimes as some of you know, but she, she did it with such grace and we actually found out we had the same Meyer Briggs personality, which I thought that was really cool. Um, on top of that, I would also say thank you to Kelsey Valla um, for doing the recipe editor, um, recipe editing for all the formatting, um, you know, and even trying the 10 most complex recipes in my book and really giving me some really great feedback on that. And lastly, I want to shout out to Gail O'Hara, who is our editor, in, um, chief editor, and she made sure that everything was great from cover to cover. And she was also one one of the um, drivers of the main melting pot. So um, I just really want to thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. I honestly have so much gratitude to every each and every one of you because I met you in every different stage of life. So I'm so grateful that you could spend this time with me.